Welcome to Kirkley's Libraries Library Adventures Live. My name's Jude and I'm one of the librarians that works for Kirkley's Libraries. I'm extremely excited to be presenting today's Library Adventures Live. And I don't know about you, but I, I always watch Library Adventures Live on a Tuesday at 11 a.m. or I should say, I always try and watch Library Adventures live on a Tuesday at 11 a.m. Sometimes, like you, I'm guessing, I'm super busy and I don't get a chance to watch it live. So it's a great thing that it's recorded and we can catch up at a later date when it's convenient for us. So all you need to do is go to the Kirkley's YouTube Kirkley's Libraries YouTube or Kirkley's Libraries Facebook and you can click on any of our Library Adventures live recordings and watch at your own convenience. Now I did watch last week's Library Adventures live and I did watch it live. I saw the amazing author Anthea Simmons and Anthea Simmons wasn't on her own in the studio. No, she had her cat with her, her cat called Karamak. And there's something quite unusual about Karamak. Karamak is a polydactyl cat. I know, I didn't know what a polydactyl cat was either until I watched Anthea Simmons last week. So if you wanna find out what a polydactyl cat is, and see a ginger and white polydactyl cat, just go to Kirkley's Libraries YouTube or Kirkley's Libraries Facebook page and click on Anthea Simmons Library Adventures Live and you'll be able to see them. Plus, you'll get introduced to the amazing, great fossil hunter, Mary Anning. Now, Mary Anning is the heroine of Anthea Simmons' book, Lightning Mary and you get to go on a windswept adventure to Dorset and you get to find, you get to see some fossils just like Mary found. Plus you get to go back in time to when the dinosaurs used to roam the world, all in an hour. And don't forget that you can, you can have a look and read Anthea's book by borrowing it from Kirkley's libraries. I'm just going to bring a couple of banners up now to show you where to go to borrow some books. So you can borrow ebooks, audio books that you'll be able to listen to. There we go. Let's get one of the banners up. I won't be a minute. So you can go to kirkleyslibraries.co.uk and you'll be able to have a look around there and you'll be able to get up to date information about what's happening in the libraries. Also up to date information about lots of different Library Adventures Live and lots of different events that the libraries put on. Plus you'll be able to go to the library catalog and have a look, see if you want to borrow a book. Or alternatively, you can go to kirklees.overdrive.com and you'll go directly to our catalog. You'll just need your library card number and your PIN number, and then you'll be able to have a good look around and see all the Library Adventures authors books there. You might need a little bit of help for some of these, so just ask a grown up. And don't forget that we want to see some of your drawings. Maybe you've done some models like Anthea asked for last week, some models of fossils and some drawings of fossils. Maybe you've written a story. Maybe you've got a photo of a drawing that you did. And if you have any of those, we're always super excited to see them. We can share them with the authors that you watched if you just name the author and we can put them on our social media. So if you just send them to our email address at LAL, that's LAL, LAL, which is Library Adventures Live at kirklees.gov.uk. Again, you might want to ask a grown up to help you with that, but we can put them on our social media as well. We've got a super website where we can put things. So, I wonder what's going to happen today. Hmm. Well, I know one of the things that I'd really like to happen today, and that's I would like some questions from you and some comments. And you can always say a big hello to either me or the super guests that we're going to have in the studio quite soon. And all you need to do to send your questions or your comments is just pop them in the Facebook page chat box or the YouTube chat box and then they'll come straight over to us. And during today's show, we'll be able to have a 
a good look at, at them and we'll be able to answer them as we go along. So let's see where we're up to now. Oh, I know, I've got a couple of questions for you. One of the questions is, do you think it would be ace to go into space? Are you a poet and you didn't know it? Or are you a poet and you do know it? Like our two special guests today, which I probably have given you a little bit of a clue about what we've got on today. We've got two poets who definitely do know it. Two poets that are published and they're going to deliver a spacetastic poetry edition for Library Adventures Live today. So all we've got to do is give a big round of applause yeah, to Conrad Burdekin, who I am just going to invite into the studio now. Hi, Conrad. And the second person is Dom Conlon, who I'm inviting into the studio now. Yeah, how both? How are both of you today? And welcome absolutely. to Library Adventures Live. Thank you. We're absolutely. I'm absolutely fantastic. It's a lovely day. Yeah. No, I'm good as well. Lovely to be here. Thanks, Jude. Good stuff. And I hope you didn't mind the big round of applause for you today. I'm Loved presuming it. there's Loved it. people out there all watching as well. <laughs> and I like the poems that you put through as well, Jude. That was oh, great. did you? I thought I'd try. <laughs> I, know, I know that you're going to have lots of tips for everyone to write some kind of better poems than I did today as well. But it's always good to have a go, isn't it? It is. So, uh I think over to you two. I'm just going to see if I can shrink myself down. Let's have a look. Oh, no, I made myself a lot. She's, she's taking over. I'm so sorry. I don't think you're <laughs> here to talk to me. I'll just sit quietly in the corner <laughs> and then hand things over to. Oh, she's Hello, gone on Dom, mute, Dom. Good, after, you, yeah. good morning, even, Dom. Good We're not morning. even at the afternoon yet. We're not, no, no. So how are you, Conrad? Conrad, tell you what, let's start by you telling us a little bit about you and your books and why you like being a poet. That's a load of things to talk about. You could, you could probably talk about an for an hour about that, couldn't you? Uh, it sounds good to me. So uh, my name's Conrad Burdekin and I live in West Yorkshire. And I have been writing poems, oh, I guess for about 30 years, actually. I started writing them at school. And my poems are quite wacky, a bit crazy, just everyday ideas talked about in a different way of looking at things. And I just love it. I just love writing poems. Oh, there you're holding up my latest books. <laughs> now, I must say it is slightly misleading, this new book, because it is called Space Cafe and Other Poems. But unlike your book, which I'm about to hold up, Dom, <laughs> your book is all about space poems and specifically the moon, right? My book that's called Space Cafe and Other Poems is about all sorts of different uh, things. So yours, I think, is a bit more spacey than mine. But we've got lots of space poems coming up, haven't we? We have. And the, the thing is, though, is even though mine is themed around the moon, they're all about different things as well because... Yeah. We use these kind of ideas, and you have in yours, um, just to get at different things that we want to that we find funny or that we find interesting, yeah. uh, and that's to me is what the power of poetry is. So I love I love space, I do, and I love nature, and I love looking around, and I love people, and that helps me to think about writing poetry, um, and, yeah. and that's really strong. Should we start with one of your poems? Let's start with it. What we're going Let's for, a day in the life of a star? I think we should. Okay, so um, while Jude... Ma oh, look, I'm big! Jude, you've made me big! Get in! <laughs> Hello, everyone. Well, this poem, um, it's kind of a countdown poem. You know, the like countdown of space, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. But what I was thinking about, I was looking at the stars one night, and I thought, I wonder what it's like to be a star. I wonder what you have to do if you're a star. Do you get out of bed and brush your teeth in the morning? I don't know. So I wrote this poem. It's called A Day in the Life of a Star. Ten, eat a bowl of Milky Way sprinkled with moon dust. Nine, grant as many wishes as possible. 
eight, sharpen all five points until they're sharper than a shark's teeth. Seven, paint body with silver glitter. Six, polish face until it sparkles. Five, practice shooting across the universe's eerie darkness. Four, fill up at the garage with bubbling gas. Three, stick yourself onto the enormous blanket of space. Two, wink at the moon for good luck. One, take a deep breath and twinkle. <laughs> Comrade, I absolutely love that. That's amazing. It really is. Because like you, that, that's the kind of thing that I like to do. I like to sit outside in the garden at night and think, what would it be like to be a star? What would it be like to be to be the the, the train uh, that's whizzing past the house, you know, about a mile away that I can hear on a clear night? And and these things take you in all extraordinary kind of places, don't they? And that's why I like poetry, because you can really do things with poetry that you wouldn't normally think about. So that's a star. But I've thought before, like, what would it be like to be a fork? I think it'd be quite boring to be a fork because most of your life you're shut in a drawer with no light. But then every now and then you get out and you can stab sausages and stuff. So it, you could do it with anything. What's it like to be a shoe or a sock or what's it like to be the fridge? And then you could do a big countdown poem of that. That would be an excellent thing. So a shoe would be great because all the places you might go to, all the kind of yeah. uh, all the kind of things that you would see from from a really small kind of uh, perspective as well. That's really interesting. Isn't it? I think I read a, yeah. uh, a few years ago about life from a from a dog's sort of uh, perspective. So so you could do all sorts of. I love that. That's a really good idea. That and, like and that. you know I you like can. I, I remember the. You, you know the 500 words competition that they run as well? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the winners this year was a diary extract of uh, Life of a Five Pound Note. And uh, yeah. it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, poetry can take you and do all that sort of stuff. My five pound notes tend to have a very short <laughs> lifespan. <laughs> I, I read some advice the other day that said don't iron a five pound note because yeah. of the new stuff. Now you iron it and it goes all shriveled up. I can't say so, I've ever thought about right, ironing a note. So Dom, I think um, are we going to are we going to hear one of your poems? Because we're going to iron. Can we and hear one of you yours? Know, that that kind of day when you when you told me you were going to read uh, that one of yours. It made me go back to my book and think about the origins of the moon, the early solar system. So this is, we're talking four and a half billion years ago. And when the sun had just kind of uh, been created and then there was loads of rocks around and they're all smashing into each other and, and clumping together and forming the planets and then the moons. And then what's left over is the kind of a... The, uh, the crunchy, gravelly asteroid, like a cereal, bowl of cereal of the, of the solar system. So that made me want to write a poem uh, about about those days, about about four and a half billion years ago. <laughs> um, so this this is quite an old poem. It's called In Those Days. Before this planet began, it was wild, child. It was wild. Each rock would knock and crash and smash. And it was wild, child. It was wild. So bit by bit and hit by hit, each lump would clump and go and grow and know this time was wild, child. It was wild. And all in all, it made a ball on which we'd crawl and stand up tall and call it Earth. And it was wild, child. It was wild. Then when still hot, the lot got hit by a bit which didn't fit. So wham and slam and soon the moon was hewn and shone and shone and it was wild, child. It was wild. It was wild, child. It was wild. And year on year, it orbits here. Though not as near, yes, less and less. But you and me, we both still see the moon up in the sky. And it is wild, child. It is wild. Oh, Dom, I love that poem. It's got a real feeling of one of my favourite poets called Shel Silverstein, an American poet, with the, the wild child repetition going on, addressing the reader almost at... Oh, so when so when when you wrote that, Dom, now I, I'm interested in this because what I noticed in this poem, a lot of people think poems have to rhyme and they don't always. 
but you seem nope. to be doing something very clever that that some of your words are rhyming inside each line. Is that right? That's right. And and I find that kind of um <clears throat> so we can use rhyme and you use rhyme really, really well to give us a sense of rhythm and a sense of pace. Mm. So mm. um there's, there are some great poems. There's a, a Tennyson poem which starts uh, with a hey and a ho and a hey nanny no. And <laughs> that, those words just rattle through. And it's, it mimics the, the running of a horse, or lots of horses, oh, actually. Yeah, yeah. And you've got that kind of with a hey and a ho and a hey nanny no. And if you do uh, moon and soon and tune, and if you put them all together rather than maybe at the end of uh, yeah. lines, You've got something that you just want to rattle along, and it creates that kind of that kind of chaos. And and that's what I love about poetry is, and I will tell this to everybody: it's got tools, not rules. And poet and rhyme and uh, metaphors and similes are all great tools that you can use any way you want. Like you said before, a, a poem can be anything you want. It and that's what's really exciting about this kind of a. Uh, that they, this kind of job that we both do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and, and I, I liked I, also, Dom, I liked in, in how you read it as well, because I think how, how poems are written, I think it can be added to when they're performed, like you've just done there. Because on the written page, the one thing, but on the written page, it's not like piano music where it says, do this bit, that speed, and that bit, that speed. But I noticed that, that in the middle of the verses, you were getting quick, and then it was wild, and you were going slow. And then it was getting quick, and it was getting slow. What were you looking to achieve there what 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 were you trying to do with that speeded up and slowing down part well i suppose it's that it's the same thing a musician will do it's trying to to get a pace to reflect what the poem's about so the poem is about the early chaos of the of the solar system and yeah and rocks smashing together so you want to smash words together and there's a there's a very famous uh, poet called e.e e. cummings who does this Mm. And he will literally ram six or seven words together. Um, so he might use a phrase like far and we, uh, and he'll it, make it all into one big word. And you can okay. do that. And I think that's what's exciting about poetry. You can do all these kind of amazing things. And you can say, actually, I'm going to have a big gap between that word and that word. Or I'm yeah, going to yeah. have no gaps at all. Or I'm going to sort of make people speak fast. And, and I mean, how do you, wh why do you, turn to rhyme with, for your poem yeah that's a good question not all of my poems rhyme but i find no, no. It, it's a funny thing i find it comes most naturally for me to write a rhyming poem so quite often if i start out writing a non-rhyming poem by the middle of the second verse i find that i'm i'm rhyming okay. and that's the thing that comes naturally to me and yet when i'm teaching poetry i find teaching rhyming poetry the most difficult form of poetry to teach to children it it's really so it, it isn't easy, it, it, is it? I mean, like you say, if it comes naturally, that is a real gift. It's a difficult mm. thing to, to do properly. But now, uh, just before we move on to the next poem, Dom, I just wanted to ask you something about that poem that you've just read. Because in the last verse, it says, year on year, it orbits here, though not as near, yes, less and less. Is the moon moving away from us? It is. Tiny bit so, by tiny bit. On it, so, right. The, this is the thing, right? I also find poetry teaches you loads of stuff. I, when mm. I've read your book, I've learned loads and I've been on Google looking up stuff. <laughs> I did not know the moon was moving away from us. So yeah. like in, in millions of years, will it be like halfway across the universe and we'll just see a little dot in the sky or what? No. Um, in millions of years, it will, it will get to a point where it will, the, the, the gravitational pull of the Earth and the gravitational pull of the moon will balance out. And so it will get to a point. So the best thing to, to illustrate this is the moon wasn't always that distant. So it's about 220,000 miles away at the moment. And right. uh, But when it was created, when this poem is set, the moon was really close. And oh. our days our days were only uh, eight hours long. No. And so a bit by bit, over over this four and a half billion years, the moon has gone further and further away to where it is now, um, and it still pulls at the tides, and which which and it balances the Earth wobble. It does so many things. It's an incredible. <laughs> honestly, come to the lecture, or the science lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing that poetry can do. It can 
it can teach you loads of stuff. Now, shall we crack on with the next one? Is that all right, Dom? Yes. And because we, I know what's coming next, and I want to say this is, I love this. What you do here with this next poem, everybody's going to be waiting now, is really, really <laughs> clever. Uh, it goes right back to how I think, as, and you've probably seen this, as you go through schools, children, you ask who likes poetry, and then in, in reception, everybody's got their hand up. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, in, and then gradually as you, go, as you get older, people go mm, sometimes, and, and you, they, we seem to lose it. But our very, the very first introduction to words is poetry. Yeah. And, and so what you're going to do now, go on, I want you to read this poem because okay. I thank you so much. It's wonderful. So this poem, um, I'll talk a bit more about it later, but this is based on something called uh, Spoonerism. And anyone who has ever worked with me in schools, you will know how much I like Spoonerisms. And very simply, Spoonerisms are where you take two words and you switch the beginning sound of each word. So for an easy example, Conrad Burdekin is my name. To spoonerize me, I would become Bonrad Kurdikin. And I just love playing with words, puns. My whole family grew up on puns. My granny used to say that she was a very punny granny. And uh, that, I think, is probably where we get this. So you might recognize this nursery rhyme. It is space-themed, but it might sound a little bit different. Here we go. It's called Linkle, Linkle, Twittle Star. Linkle, linkle, twittest, twittle star. Wow, I wonder yacht woo are. Up above the hurled so why? Dike a limand in the sky. Linkle, linkle, twittle star. Wow, I wonder yacht woo are. <laughs> my, my, my first question there, Conrad, is honestly, how do you even read that and not because your brain wants to say it properly? I, I do, do you know? I think I can probably do it without it. Let's have a look. Linkle, linkle, twittle star, yow I wonder what you are. Up above the hill, so why? Dike alignment in the sky. Linkle, linkle, twittle star, yow I wonder what you are. And you know what, Dom, I've got another answer to that as well. When I was younger, we used to go on lots of bike rides with school. And one day, somehow or other, we learned how much is that dog in the window backwards. So it's um, dog, uh, how much is that dog in the wi window in the doggy? That is much out. Tell waggly the with one there. And it goes on. And I spent an 87 mile bike ride with that in my head from mile one to mile 87. So I think I've kind of been preparing for this life ever since I was younger. I love spoonerisms. I would encourage everyone to have a go, but think of them in your head first, because every now and then when you switch words, it sounds a little bit rude. So you do need to be careful how you say it. But it, Dom, it's again, talking about language. English is the best language in the world to spoonerize because we've got the biggest vocabulary. And so there's so many hundreds of thousands of words to switch about that it, it just works fantastically well. I just love doing it. No, I, th I think what you've done there as well is a really interesting model for writing a poem as well. So not just the spoonerism side of it, but taking taking classic nursery rhymes, yeah, and then going, well, what could we, what could we, what else could we do? Because we talked about rhyme before and about how it gives you that sense of rhythm, and your yeah. poetry, your poetry is is like music in that way, and that's what I love, and. Nursery rhymes are our very first introduction to poetry. Yeah, and yeah. they've all got they're all about the rhythm. So, twinkle, twinkle, little star. So, uh, um, ba ba black sheep. Have you any? Everything kind of. You mean a, um, a you mean uh, sha sha back bleep. <laughs> <laughs> this is that is a remarkable gift you have there. <laughs> but it's an incredible thing, isn't it? And and you could easily write poems based on the rhythms. And the style of a of a nursery rhyme. So, bar bar black sheep could be uh, wolf wolf big dog. Uh, yes, hasn't got a bone. Or I, I, I um, did one uh, in in my book right at the end in in the kind of notes, which was about. Uh, so, one of the first um, satellites that went into space was called Sputnik, and after that, there was uh, the Russians sent quite a few. And one of the early ones that went to the moon was called Luna. Uh, Luna right. one and that kind of went round. Uh, so I did one called uh, Little Bot Luna, 
so it's like um, uh, Little Bo Peep. It was that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Uh, it was a little bot, little bot Luna lost its peep and doesn't know where to find it. So it's that that <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, that, that, and that's a great kind of simple model that you can all go. Well, okay, we'll take this classic rhyme and this and see what we can kind of create on it about ourselves. But that goes back to Dom, I think. Oh, I do have to just explain now. Dom, talk to the uh, audience for a moment. That's my yeah. dog, Pebbles. One moment, I'm going to mute her. I'll be back in a second. He so, said Dom, that might be coming in at some point. <laughs> Comrade's now got a dog emergency who's, uh, who's chasing the postman uh, right around the village. So it'll be fine, that. But what Comrade's done there um, is really clever. And the idea of of playing with words, being playful with them, with the spoonerisms and with all kind of things that all these tools that we've got is a really good uh, <laughs> a really is sort of good way to I, I'm really distracted. I want to meet the dog again. It's a really good way for children to have a play with words and get the fun out of all the words and things. And I just poetry is it's all about fun. It's all about fun. Unlike you know, you try and uh, write a story and stories are difficult because you got to stick to certain structures but with poetry you can yeah. just it's, it's Turn just them right down back to front i just jumped back in because i just wanted to say that kirkley's college lrc which i think will be a learning center learning resource they, center i used to work in one too oh, there you go yeah. Well, we've got a hi Jude, Dom and Con from Emily and Alison there. And we've also got a comment from somebody called, oh yeah, Olivia. We've got Olivia, tools, not rules. I love that. Great, empowering quote for all budding poets. I'm going to um, steal that from Dom. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> so, uh, except I'll get it wrong and I'll say tools, not rulers, and I'll hold a ruler up and then wonder why everyone's <laughs> looking weird at me. <laughs> so we have got questions coming in pretty fast and furious, but oh. and then we'll put some time aside a bit later to answer yeah. those. So please keep bringing, send in your questions, send your comments in, and we'll get around to answering them a little bit later after some more. That'll be, that'll be Brummel at the LRC, won't it? Uh, that'll be Alison Brummel, I bet. Yeah, I bet, I bet you it will. Be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Alison. <laughs> uh, comrade. Give us your, your next poem, because we I think we need to rattle on a bit. All right, you better tell me. What, oh, I'll tell you what. Let me just quickly do. I, I've got another space-themed uh, Spoonerism one. See if you know what this one is. I'll see if I can remember it. Hey, diddle, diddle, the fat and the kiddle, the cow mumped over the dune. The little log daft to see such fun, and the spish ran away with the dune. <laughs> I know that one. I know that one. Is that the one about the mulberry bush? Oh, you're so close, but no. <laughs> um. Well, I'm just wondering time-wise, shall I do my Spoonerisms poem, the actual Spoonerisms one, or shall we move on to your next one, Don? What do you reckon? Up to you. Entirely up to you, Conrad. Let, let's do, do this one quickly, because I, this is probably one of my favourite poems, just because um, I, I just like playing with language, but I'm quite proud of this one. Uh, and, and I want to just talk very quickly about where you get inspiration from. My friend Craig... Um, when he was younger, he was diagnosed with dyslexia. So it, it was a real struggle for him to um, read uh, to a level that he was meant to. He's very intelligent. And he was telling me of some of the things that he often muddles up and gets mixed around. So, for example, instead of calling a, a steering wheel a steering wheel, he will often say a wearing steel. And uh, he was uh, in a restaurant once and he wanted a tap of glass water and asked for a glass of tap water and all sorts of things. And when he told me this, I could not stop thinking about it. And Spoonerisms are called that because they're based around a guy called William Archibald Spooner, who was a reverend back in the 1800s, I think, and also a teacher. And he often got words mixed up and all around. Pebble, stop barking. Goodness gracious me. Bop Starking. <laughs> so this is a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a challenge for all the listeners. Um, it's called Spoonerisms or Slips of the Tongue. And I want you guys to see if you can count up how many times you hear me spoonerize something. Here we go. This poem is full of spoonerisms. Dear reader, let us start. See if you can say them all 
for that's the funniest part. Letters getting changed around, retting arranged, amusing tips of the slung sounding rather strange. Take a car, for instance. It has a wearing steel, two black screened ween wipers. Are these words even real? I blame the Reverend Spooner for words my mixing up. Back in the 1800s, he never would up shop. His fame for metting good old made people law with rafter. He was no fupid stool, but his words kept getting dafter. Have a tap of glass water, he'd tell his thirsty friends. He could not get his words out right, he mud not cake amends. This poem is full of funerisms. Rear Dida, play your part. See if you can say them all, for that's the punniest fart. <laughs> <laughs> By Bonrad Kurdikin. Don't forget the Bonrad Kurdikin. There, I've had my fun, Dom. Quick, bring us back to some sort of sanity. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll, we'll move along from, uh, from, from, from Comrade's ending there. To, uh, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a very short poem, and it's using a technique... Uh, which is a really old, old style of writing called kennings. So at school you may have done metaphors and similes, and you probably have done, uh, and you'll have done things like onomatopoeia and, and all these kind of really cool things. But often I find that children don't understand what a kenning is. And a kenning is two words to describe something. So, And if you understand this, you can write an entire poem just on kenning. So this one's called What Am I? It's a great kind of quiz poem as well. Earth Orbiter. Rock blaster, hook scraper, shape caster, sea puller, night lighter, sky watcher, sunbiter, footprint hoarder, flag carrier, shadow sweeper, meteor barrier. What am I? So that, that's all a simple poem made up of just of kennings. And a kenning, you can ask somebody to describe, say, I, I did this for a year five uh, uh, class uh, a few years ago describe a whale and one boy put his hand up and he said ocean balloon and it's just nice. <laughs> I've never I've never heard as good a kenning as that because it just gives you an image of what the whale is an ocean balloon absolutely so it's a great kind of uh technique right we do need to rattle on a bit so comrade give us what we're going out. for let's going have a look supersonic gram i think oh yes i have tried to keep space related yes now again this this poem, I, I often, when I read this poem to children, I do explain that a lot of my poems start in the everyday. So I was actually also with a bunch of year five people. And one of the boys came over to me and said, Conrad, can I tell you about my grandma? And I went, okay. And he said, she's a bit weird. And I thought, oh, okay. I said, why is she weird? And he said, she only eats three things. And I went, what, like each day? And he said, no, in the whole world, she only eats three things. And I had to guess what things she liked. And I was saying toffees and chocolate and all this. No, she loved baked beans, Brussels sprouts and um, cauliflower. And Ooh. I was like, wow, um, yeah. that's going to do stuff to your insides. I said to him, what, what is it like spending time with your grandma? He said, Conrad, I have to eat my tea with her every night. It's a nightmare. It's loud and it's quite stinking. I was like, I've had an idea for a poem. And so I took that. And, and this is the thing as well, because a lot of my ideas come from children, they generally quite often appeal to children because it's I'm just sort of passing on the idea to all the others. So this is a poem that does work nicely if um, there's a big crowd. Obviously, there's not today because I'm in my kitchen on my own. But the um, I've exaggerated it. I do a lot of exaggerating in poems. So I took that simple idea of a grandma who only liked those three foods, and then I've turned it into a poem called Supersonic Gram. And the, the chorus of it finishes, my gran is super, and then normally all the children go, Sonic! So if you want to shout Sonic wherever you are, you can, but I'll do it as well. Here we go. My gran has got a problem. She only eats three things. Cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and baked beans from a tin. My gran is rocket powered. Her bottom sure is chronic. She flies so fast it's made the news. My gran is supersonic. She, oh, go on, Dom. You're going to be my audience for the next time. She has a bowl of sprouts for lunch, followed by some beans. Cauliflower spread on toast. You know what all that means. 
Tommy's. By half past two, her tummy's moaning. After three, my granny's groaning. Four o'clock, she cannot walk. And then her bum begins to talk. <laughs> my granny's rocket-powered. Her bottom sure is chronic. She flies so fast, it's made the news. My granny's super... Sonic. Yes, you too. <laughs> Blasting through our kitchen walls. She really is a sight. Whizzing, zooming, bottom booming in the dead of night. But best of all on Christmas Day, Gran ate a thousand sprouts. She clutched her rear, said, oh, sorry, dear, and <laughs> let a huge one out. Loud enough to shake the house, it smashed mum's favourite vase. As through the roof, my grandma shot and landed up on Dom. Mars. Yes, <laughs> my granny's rocket powered. Her bottom sure is chronic. She flies so fast, it's made the news. My granny's super sonic. sonic. Go on, Jude. <laughs> P.S. Gets very serious now. Grandma, if you're reading this, we're feeling rather glum. We miss you such a lot, you know. We even miss your... Oh, don't say it. <laughs> don't say it. Um, so, uh, and then I tell the children, so, you know, if you look through a telescope, you look up into the sky, who knows? You might see grandma up on Mars. I don't know. She might still be there. And on, on a slightly serious note, sometimes children say, Conrad, that wouldn't work. And they don't have a problem with the flying into the air from eating too many Brussels sprouts. But they say to me, she didn't have a space helmet on. So when she went into space, she wouldn't have survived. To which I say, well, that's one of the reasons I like poetry. Because you can make impossible things immediately become possible. But actually, let's hope that's one of the times that that doesn't become possible. Well, yes, all right then. <laughs> possible in the imagination, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Let's, I keep it, let's keep it there. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. And that's so much fun. Um, and, and like you... I, I look around and get kind of ideas from from ordinary things, from from talking to people or from thinking yeah. about things, and and uh, and so my my next poem um, is kind of looking back at my childhood and realizing where this kind of love of, of of space and science and and all the other things came from. And it's when I got a telescope when I was about seven, and uh, and they weren't as posh as they are today. So today you get them all with fancy things on them. And uh, and and I wouldn't have a telescope now. I'd just use a pair of binoculars if I wanted to look at the stars. But back then we had this very simple telescope on these on wooden on a wooden tripod. And I wrote this poem called Father Christmas Sent Me to the Moon. <laughs> I don't know how he put it there. Our gas fire blocked the chimney. And the green rug where I played had never magically flown for me. But there it was, a telescope unwrapped but still a mystery centered like a compass needle pointing the way to my heart i lifted it to the window lowered its legs like a newborn lambs and opened its eye to a world still waiting to be cratered by snowballs i took my first footsteps before i could breathe when i looked at the moon and learned to believe oh. so, so so you're using a memory to inspire that poem then? Yeah, yeah, just as you used a conversation. And it's just finding different ways to to explore the, the stuff that interests us, isn't it? The, yeah. the stuff that makes us laugh yeah. or makes us think or anything. And and that and and I and I know poetry and I feel this in my heart genuinely that poetry is a language, our natural language. It's our way we talk to each other and the yeah. way and because a lot of older people, people my age probably and, and older, will go, I'm not keen on poetry because it's a bit posh, uh, or I'm not keen on poetry because I don't understand it. And I just don't see that because you've just not found the poetry that you love. And yes. it's, it's a way of saying, I don't like music because I don't understand classical music, or I don't understand yeah. like music because I don't like jazz. And But you think all the songs that we share, the greeting cards that we, mm. we send to each other, these are the, they're all poetry. This is poetry kind of put into different into different formats. That j Dom, just read me that line again about the compass and the heart. How did that bit go? So, uh, but there it was, a telescope, unwrapped but still a mystery, centred like a compass needle, 
pointing the way to my heart. So just unpick that a bit for me. What what are you saying with this compass heart, uh, pointing to your heart? So you've got two things. You've got the telescope, which kind of you point at the moon or yeah, yeah. Uh, or the stars or whatever. Um, and But also this telescope that, that just like you get a compass trying to find true north, yeah, uh, magnetic north, and it goes, it flickers around. Waving all that, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and then you know it's there. Then that to me is what this this present did for me it gave me uh-huh. it pointed straight to my heart it found the, the 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 north in me basically that this is where i wanted to to go to for you know for in my life i wanted to keep exploring uh, these, so these when kind of i i think that one of the values of poetry as well dom that we've not necessarily mentioned yet is that a poem that say you write that talks about a memory or or some effect it has on you can then have a similar effect on a reader. So, Mm. for example, when I read that poem and listening to it again now, I started thinking about Christmas presents that I'd received. And I was older. I was probably about 15 or maybe I think maybe 15, and I got given a word processor. Now, a word processor is something children won't really know now. It it wasn't quite a typewriter. It was electronic. It was a Smith Corona word processor. And it had a little green screen and you could see two lines of text at any one time. And I got this on Christmas morning and I went upstairs, worked it out and typed up the menu for the afternoon of what we're having at Christmas and proudly put this typed out thing. And when it typed out, it went and the whole house shook with this thing. And that was like a compass needle centered at my heart. It is without, I just, that was just me thinking this is my true north. But it was so lovely to have been reminded of that memory through hearing and listening to a poem of yours about one of your memories that did the same thing. And and I think that's important with poetry. It can help people understand their own experience of, of the world, really. Do you know, the, when you were talking then about that, and I heard a poem to the word processor that you've just, you could literally start using those words that you've just used. It wouldn't, it would be a poem. It'd be a beautiful mm. poem about the power of 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 words and so on. Uh, I, 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 I was in a, that, I was really in good. a staff room, Dom, talking about words, and they had a massive photocopier, and it was going as it printed them out. And I was just, and then it went as it did some others. And I was like, photocopy, 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 yeah. staple, staple. And I was like, whoa, there's a whole part. The, the, the photocopy is telling me a poem. <laughs> it was amazing. So yeah, I can get that with the word processor as well. Jude's coming to tell us off because we're not going quick enough. I know. I'm just thinking that. <laughs> I will never tell you off. It's so amazing to hear you have a chat and read your poems and discuss poetry. And there's an obvious, absolute love of poetry between all of you. And the love of words as well, that joy of hearing sounds and putting words to them and mixing them up back to front, upside down. Um, yes, but I am moving it on. <laughs> what? I, I thought- be doing this all day i do not lie but it's now quarter to 12. so i know we've still got a challenge to set um and we've also got questions to answer i I think so yeah you've got maybe a poem to read and then i've just got to give a little bit of a what's happening next week so So, i'll jump back out and leave you to do the challenge if that's okay yeah dom you go for it with this challenge i think that would be a good idea so here's a poem that we thought, uh, Conrad and I were talking about, and we thought this would be a good challenge poem because it's something that you can take away, and I'll explain why in a few minutes, and Conrad will jump in as well. So this poem's called Moon Baggage. Everything was packed, the air to keep them breathing on it, the fuel to carry them to it, the food to keep them strong for it, the suits to keep them warm on it, the cameras to show the world it, and the tools to find what made it. But they also packed. The generations spent looking up at it, the myths of dragons who ate it, the hearts of lovers who met beneath it, the brave souls who sailed by it, the seers who said it would return, the charts of the scientists who measured it, the leaps in the dark to it, the balloon rides to it, even the dreams of it were stowed tight until the spacecraft became light enough to fly to it. Oh, man. So what we thought we'd do 
what we, what we want you to do is to write your poem. And it doesn't have to be about the moon, but it has to be about back packing a bag. Packing a bag that, and you'll put some real things. So maybe you're going to school, maybe you're going to grandma's, maybe you're going uh, on holiday, whatever you want to do. Go on a journey somewhere and pack your bag for it. So pack your bag with things you will actually need. So physical items, an apple, uh, a phone maybe, um, a book, definitely. Probably one of Comrade's books. Tools and, and rulers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> rulers. <laughs> and then... Uh, and, um, do another verse of things that you might be taking with you. So you might be excited. So you will pack your excitement into the bag. Or you might be worried. So you'll pack your worries into the bag. Maybe uh, you've had a conversation about it. And so you'll pack the words that mum said before we left. Go to the toilet before you leave. <laughs> We're not stopping halfway there. So things like that. I want you to do that. And so you can go from what's called the literal, the actual, the physical objects, to the metaphorical, the things that might not you might not be able to pick up, but you can say that, actually, I'm carrying that with me as well, and do that. So we thought that would be a good challenge for you. And we so want I to read the poem. So, on, Dom, I, I was just thinking, like, my youngest daughter just started high school a couple of weeks ago, so she had to take old PE kit, socks, rulers, whatever. But then I suppose if you're moving on to the metaphorical, she took a pair of sweaty palms or a tummy full of butterflies or yeah. a nervous smile or do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. A blistered heel or whatever because the new school shoes had been rubbing while she tried to wear them in at home. So, and, and that's another reason I love poetry because it can appeal to all ages and abilities because it's perhaps a little easier to think of the physical things you take but it's really nice to challenge yourself and think of those metaphorical things. And we would love to read them. Absolutely, we would, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Right, I think Jude's here now with some questions. Yeah, shush, oh, Jude's in I'm, charge. I'm, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, I don't wish, actually. I think it's like when the head teacher them. walks into the classroom and everyone goes like that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm done. Great. Um, I just wanted to put a banner up just because people might not know where to send their poems to share with oh, us. okay, yeah, yeah. So, if they want to, obviously, they can put them through Facebook and in the YouTube comments as part of the chat. But it'd be really good to get them via email to us at the library. And then we can share them with you directly. And hopefully, you'll be able to maybe give a bit of a response of them. So yeah, yeah. let's put that up. So that's <coughs> our email address is LAL, which stands for Library Adventures Live. So LAL at kirklees.gov.uk. And you can always ask a grown up to give you a hand with doing that as well if you want so send them to us and we'll be able to forward them on to both Dom and Conrad to have a look at too and like you say straight to a couple of questions I think we've only got time just for one or two because time's moving on it's just taking us so quickly so um we've got one from Amanda Ambler Dom and Conrad, do you each have a favourite poem and which is it? Why? Sorry, I can't even read today. Why is it your favourite? Dom, Dom, you can go first. Right. <laughs> I, I have lots of favourite uh, poems. Um, but one that is springing to mind at the moment is by E.E. E. Cummings. And uh, I can only remember um, the first part. Well, I could remember the whole thing, but it would be too long. But it's uh, Maggie and Millie and Molly and May went down to the sea to play one day. And if you look that poem up, it's available on, on the internet, definitely. Um, it's, it just has a beautiful thing in it, a beautiful rhythm to it, a beautiful rhyme to it. And E. Cummings is a, a master of imagery. And he just, uh, it, it, I'm not even going to spoil the ending of it, but it's got a beautiful ending. Uh, which just just gets me every single time, definitely. Awesome. Go on, I'm going to look that up because I don't know that one. I also have got lots of favourite poems, lots of favourite poets. I love Roger McGough. Um, I love Shel Silverstein. But a poem I've read a lot in the last year or two to children because I've discovered a lot don't know that Roald Dahl wrote some amazing poems where he spoofed like well-known traditional tales and the one, in fact, uh, they were made into an animated series last Christmas before this one. And the one of Little Red Riding Hood, and especially the bit where she whipped a pistol <laughs> from her knickers, bang, 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 and she shoots him dead. And children 
lit i reckon 85 90 percent of children i read that to it's the first time they've ever heard it and it's such a privilege sharing it with them and they cannot believe it when this little red riding hood that they've all learned about in year one whips have gone out of the <laughs> I, I just love his sense of humor and so i i think that's the one i'm going to plumb for today because it's just so different to anything else that i've come across i love that i heard that in my third year french lesson my french teacher decided <laughs> to just do poetry one one day mr downley <laughs> mr downley great big ginger beard uh and he was amazing and he read that poem to us and it was just fantastic brilliant brilliant so another question that we've got through i think this might have to be the last but obviously we can send any questions that we've got we can send them through to you yeah yeah a Hey, so we've got hi Dom and Conrad, and this is from Hannah, who's one of our apprentices apprentices working in Kirkley's library with us. So she's learning all about what we do to do cool. a program like this. So I have a couple of questions for you. Do you ever get a say in how your book covers look? <laughs> um well my my first book cover, oh sorry, I'm going first if that's all right, Dom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My first book cover um, was chosen purely on which drawing was deemed to be the best. So it didn't really have anything to do with the content of the book. It was just which drawing looked best. Um, but yeah, me and my illustrator will often talk about how things look and change bits and colors and stuff like that. But ultimately, I will listen to a number of other people to see what their uh, much better skills are at knowing what what is best so i do get a bit of a say but not 100 percent. what about you dom well for um for this rock that rock i worked with vivian schwartz and i asked the publisher if i could work really closely with her and so i did all the kind of layouts and typography in it because ah. i wanted that ability to talk to vivian and she could send me a picture that she'd drawn and we go, actually, I'm going to change my poem because of what you've sent me. That's made me think of something different. And so okay. we work really closely on that. Um, and the illustrations of, of this book is uh, are absolutely essential. I know somebody else has asked. They're amazing. Uh, they're amazing. They're, 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 they're just as much uh, a part of the, of the poetry as the poetry as of the illustrations. You can't separate them, I don't think. Um, and they're all in different styles. So Vivian and I worked really closely on that. But... You can see behind me uh, a picture book, Leap Hair Leap. And I didn't, I, I got uh, sent that picture by Anastasia Rizzles, who, who was an amazing illustrator. I knew she was working on the book, and her, her illustrations are, are just incredible. And they stunned us all. We had a, a, an email from her with the roughs, and most people felt that they were the finals, and she had to correct and go, no, 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 they, you know, they will get better. And, we, <laughs> and they did. Uh, but if I showed you the roughs, you would go, my goodness, they're, they're incredible. So I did, I, that, that was chosen for me. And it's one of these things, like Conrad said, you just trust the illustrator. because I think what that's important. Doing. Exactly that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. As soon as you start to tinker and go, do you know that bit would be great over there? You've just destroyed everything. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Thank you. The, um, let's just get the last little bit of Hannah's question. We might have to be proper quick in answering this, even though it's quite a big question. Okay. Do you believe if there's life outside of planet Earth? Uh, I don't yes. always believe there's life inside of planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Dom. No, yes, definitely. It's dead quick cancer. It's definitely going to be life of some sort. Whether it's uh, like us is a, is a, a much bigger question. Uh, and there's all kind of mathematical reasons why is really really tricky uh but certainly there's this hope that they've just discovered the signs of life on venus uh um you've got a, a, one of the moons of, uh, of um, saturn enceladus which has got a liquid uh, ocean beneath the ice and then it's got a, a molten core look at me dr science all of a sudden uh, it's got a molten core which would keep the which would make it potentially possible so i i think the chances are you know, you're talking about there's 400 billion uh, solar systems in in this galaxy alone. There's a trillion galaxies. It's just the numbers, basically. It's like winning the lottery. You're going to get more than one kind of a uh, person uh, appearing in the universe. I think. 
more than one form of life. So yeah. And that's Dom Brian Cox Conlon. And I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my answer was going to be, I honestly don't know. And having listened to Brian, Dom, I would uh, say, yes, I think it's very likely. <laughs> okay. Great stuff. Well, you've had loads of positive comments. Co Sorry, I can't speak again. You've had loads of great comments coming through that everyone's thoroughly enjoying. Oh, that was nice of you to put all them up, dude. Thank you for being in the background, putting all the comments. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have that donut later. Thanks. Um, <laughs> So oh, I don't know which way you want to go around. Do you want to do one last poem before I tell everybody what's happening next week? Or do you want me to tell everybody what's happening next week and then you do your poem to finish off? It's completely up to you two. Do you want to go, comrade, you do it? And then I'll do Shall mine. Do and then you... like, okay, I'm going to, yeah, 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 fine. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Just I was going to read um, a slightly longer poem, but I think I'm... Uh, no, in fact, no, I'm going to do that. I'll be quick, I promise. Are we all right, here we go. So this is a poem about a girl called Caitlin, and this girl really exists. And she came into a, a session with me once, and the teacher said, go on, Caitlin, tell him. And I said, what? And she said, my dad calls me Caitlin Cakey Pants. And I went, why? And she said, I love chocolate cake. And that was all I needed. I said, I'm going to write a poem about you. Here we go. Caitlin Cakey Pants liked to sing and liked to dance, but most of all, she liked to bake enormous yummy chocolate cakes. Last year, she made her best by far, a cake much bigger than a car. But did she stop? Of course not, no. She yelled, OK, it's time to go and make a cake much bigger still, much taller than the tallest hill, much higher than the moon and Mars. This cake will reach up to the stars. She used a swimming pool to mix the flour, eggs and chocolate chips. A crane was used to stir it round and then guess what our Caitlin found? No ovens for this job instead. A dozen dragons, green and red, gathered round to help her bake her largest ever chocolate cake. The mixture bubbled, hissed and spat, as by the pool the dragons sat and breathed their fire through mouth and nose, watching as the mixture rose and rose and rose right through the roof. I promise you this is the truth. It surged across the countryside. There was no time to run and hide. The schools, the shops, the local zoos, were closed because of Caitlin's goo. It filled the earth, the oceans too, all down, of course, to you know who. It climbed up high. It would not cease. Oh, help, cried Caitlin. Quick, police. By morning time, the cake had raced above the clouds and into space. And so the author of this crime tried thinking up a plan in time to put the cake mix in reverse to save the world and universe. Moments later, up she leapt. I am a genius, Caitlin wept. I will not contemplate defeat. My plan is simple. I must eat. And so began the eatathon. Caitlin scoffed cake all night long. And as the night turned into day, the cake began to go away. A day passed, then a week went by, and now the cake was not so high. It came right down from outer space as Caitlin stuffed her greedy face. She showed no signs of slowing down. She did not moan. She did not frown. She simply ate without a break the whole entire chocolate cake. But sadly, she had not foreseen what eating all this cake would mean. For as she ate the final spoon, her belly burst like a big balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, we got time for another one, Judah. Do you want to just wrap up? I don't mind. Um, we're, str we're two minutes away from 12. So have you got a very quick... Sure, um, on, and then I can do the, the wrap-up. Um, you can do Quietly Remarkable, I'll, can't I'll you? Tell you? No, I was going to read one called Quietly Remarkable. And uh, it's amazing. It is It is amazing, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, tell you what, I'll just do a haiku. I'm just going to do a haiku. Uh, okay, and then we can look up, what was it called? Quietly, quietly Remarkable. remarkable. These videos of me on YouTube reading it, but this one's a haiku. Up. And I'm taking, I'm taking credit for this poem even though you might recognize the first two lines. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Historic 
moon words. Yes. It's so ace they fit mine. into a haiku. It's so <laughs> ace they fit in there. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So thank you. It has been absolutely amazing. What a treat to be part of this. Honestly, hearing all the different poems and hearing your excitement about poetry and sharing what was it? Tools, not rules, which is fantastic. And Tools, you set the challenge rules, yeah. for us about writing a poem about you are packing a bag as if you're maybe going to the moon so it could include food it could include how you're feeling it could include stories etc and again just send it to lal at kirklees.gov.uk now i'm just going to very quickly before we finish tell you what's happening next week so next week is it's tuesday the 6th of october so october starts really soon and october is Black History Month. So we have a world record holding beatboxer, Testament, who is coming in to Library Adventures Live to help celebrate Black History Month. He'll be exploring the origins of hip hop from the Bronx, New York to Huddersfield, West Yorkshire. And he'll also enable you to learn how to write your own rap verse. And that sounds absolutely awesome. And I haven't bigged him up enough, honestly. If you've enjoyed today, I'm sure you'll enjoy Testament. I feel so privileged to have such amazing wordsmiths, all these different words and all these different ways of writing poetry. It's been absolutely fantastic. And it's 12.01. <gasps> I know, we've gone one minute over, but we've had so many great comments. Everybody can watch it again if they'd like to. If they've missed certain bits or they'd like to hear the poems again, we've obviously brought up the email address for both Dom and Conrad. You can always go and have a look on them. Search YouTube for them. And you can go to Kirkley's Library's YouTube, Kirkley's Library's Facebook, and you can watch this again and hear all those wonderful poems again. So the last thing is, I'm going to give a round of applause to you both. Yeah. I'm going to give Dom go. a round of applause and you, Jude. You've been brilliant. And everybody who's been watching Watching, and it's time. I'm really sorry to say bye. <laughs> bye. Bye, bye. 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 Bye.